so this is pretty late and on the new channel. We are roughly a quarter of the way through Volume 4 and I'm playing catch up, so this is my review for Volume 4 Episode 1, The Next Step. If you want my opinions on the Ruby episodes up to this point, I made a blog post where I ranked the episodes of Ruby Volumes 1 through 3. The first episode of Volume 4 gave me a lot of what I didn't know I wanted. I love it when an episode can do that, though a lot of that is thanks to the spectacular opening, which I'm saving for a different video entirely after Volume 4 is over. One thing that was lacking in previous volumes was an insight on the villains. They schemed and did bad things, but we never learned why or even what their plans are or even how they were going about doing those plans. Even when it ultimately went down, we we're told there were some changes, so we'll never know how Cinder planned things out. We never really knew why Mercury of all people was recruited or why Neo and Emerald were kept around when their powers are arbitrarily different. We never knew what Cinder was expecting to find down in the vault or what the list from Volume 2 was about, and we still don't know anything about their motivation. Having these Meanwhile in the Legion of Doom segments have the potential to fix that issue. For the first time since ever, we actually know what the villains are doing off screen. Hazel is meeting with the White Fang leader, Watts is heading to Mistral, Cinder is playing Sorcerer's Apprentice, and Tyrion is playing Hero Hunter. If there's one problem I have with this scene, it's actually Tyrion. I love crazy characters as much as the next guy, and I like the potential that Tyrion has, but in the scene, it seems a little forced. Right now, that it's just a nitpick, and I'm withholding judgment on all of Team Witch until we get more on them, but it feels like they don't really know how to write a crazy guy. I do love Cinder in this scene, though. Salem, too. I feel like it's perfect in exactly how I would have had their dynamic. I really hope that Salem treats Cinder in sort of the same way that Cinder treats Emerald, and, and that Cinder treats Salem the same way that Emerald treats her. There's a lot of good parallels they can do there. I especially love how Cinder emotes for the first time, again, ever. I always felt like she was putting on that condescending voice to bury her emotions, again, kind of like Salem might be doing. And seeing her in this vulnerable state is an improvement on all her other scenes. Then we have the fight scene, and it's alright. It's loads better than the one from the beginning of Volume 3, and in most ways better than the mech fight from Volume 2. I don't think Team Ruby has any real synergy when they fight. They're only the best team because each of their members can single-handedly take out an average team, in Yang's case a little more literally. The best examples of this is in the Auburn fight and again with Team Funky where between those two fights there's only one real piece of teamwork. This fight is better but not by much. Miles and Carrie just suck at writing strategists, which just further hurts John's characterization. I like the reason John doesn't have his weapon, but I still don't like how he's there without a weapon. Does that make sense? Especially since the Grimm's weakness is obvious and anyone could have figured it out. So Jean is just set dressing and Rin is just eye candy, leaving the girls to do all the work. Speaking of which, between this and the character short, and let's face it, the Death Stalker, her leaving the dance, her going to fight Rowan, and her going up Beacon Tower, Ruby really has a problem with leaving her team, doesn't she? I like that it's consistent and feeds into my martyr complex theory, but she's not a good leader. The thing this fight has over, say, the Auburn fight, is that we know what each character is doing the entire time. They all have a role, even if it's kind of a pointless one, and they do at least one awesome combo without any of the stupid shipping callouts that ruin the mech fight and the bronze fight. On that note, the combo is awesome. Nora's upgrade is so cool that it retroactively ruins her character in a why didn't she already have that kind of way. And that brings me to the only real problem I have with this fight. Impact. Not story impact. It's freak of the week and it's really great to see how huntsmen work in a very show don't tell way. I'm talking about literal impact. As in, we don't see the impact that kills the Grim. We get two kill shots in this fight, and both of them are cut out. It gives the whole action scene an unsatisfying end. Even the worst fights in Ruby have had great looking and sounding kill shots. I like Jean's new look. I feel like it was the best case scenario for honoring Pyrrha's memory. 
Pyrrha was a character who had no agency over her life and was willing to sacrifice her own happiness to achieve what she thought her destiny was. So seeing what little is left of her be melted and put on Jean's sword and shield speaks volumes to what she could have been. It's a win-win. She gets to be with Jean and gets the chance to be used for great things, like cementing Lancaster. Speaking of which, the comedy bit with the sweater goes on a little bit too long and raises the question of how Ruby has never seen him without his armor on before. The only other thing to say about this episode is how well it implements world building. I always love it when we see no-name characters who are just doing their profession in a show like this. Ruby's done a fine job with that, with Shopkeeper before this and the Captain after this. I greatly prefer exposition pieces in this way over the waste of time that compromise most of the world of Remnants. That's it for this video. Join me next time when I give my thoughts on Volume 4, Episode 2. Thanks for watching.